Ah. Ah. Finally. A short and sweet one. No multiplayer. No microtransactions. You buy it. You play it. Nice wind down after Fall Guys and the other one, which were like two fucking hours long. So, get ready to go, psychedelic man. This is Hylix 2. Now, while this is a sequel, because I will bring this up, because some people will say, well, you, you didn't play the first one. What about the first one? I have had both Tyler and Blaine say, well, you're going to play the first one. <laughs> so, I, I do know that it exists. And I did think about it. I did look at it and be like, mm, let's let's look at it. But I've also heard from people that have played it. And from what I've seen on YouTube, that it's really, <laughs> really janky. Like, it's a good first attempt. I'm not saying it's bad. It's a good first attempt. But after playing number two, and then looking back at number one, I can see how this... Well, first of all, I can see how this small team learnt from the first version and really improved upon the stuff that didn't work. But at the same time, it's like... It, the first version is still janky and it, it's kind of like I can you really go back to that can you put up with with these mechanics can you put up with these controls after playing the superior version so it's like I know it's there and it, it, if you play the first one I probably recommend play the first one first then go to the second one if you're gonna do it because if you played the second one you're not really wanna go to, you're not really going to want to go back because you're gonna feel that, that stodginess so I might recommend doing the first one but yes I do know about it but no I'm not gonna play it but I did watch a let's play of it and you know it was it was a good first attempt and they really took what they learnt from their first attempt and they really Improved, improved upon all the stuff in this uh, this second attempt, while also keeping some of the stuff the same. After all, don't fix what is not broken. One of its two major selling points, Hylix prides itself. Uh, on being a psychedelic experience which is thanks to two of its marketing areas the graphics and the music the graphics being a surreal neon and watercolor vaporwave like aesthetic uh, blending and they kind of like it's very hard to explain they kind of like blend together both the uh, surreal neon and the vaporwave they blend together to create this strange yet fascinating overworld of weird sights like the TV island where a race of TV people are trying to find all 100 antennae or this strange intestine slash organ like landscape where it kind of looks like tubes and it all kind of twists and malleables together here at the end of the land at this bit so yeah it's weird and strange and it certainly captures the eye and it makes you want to keep going just to see how twisted the landscape can really get same with the enemies like at first they will be strange, but they're still basic. Like, you get these grass guys with skulls for head. It, it, it's certainly eye-catching. You know, ooh, it's, it's a little grass guy with a skull for a head. It's certainly eye-catching, but then it makes you want to push on. Just to see how strange or fucked up the enemies can get. Where you start to find things like the headless guitar player. Or this car. Or this weird thing that's like a metal shell. And when the metal shell opens, it's this fleshy, 
intestine-like interior walking man. It's certainly a feast for the eyes, and it really reminds me of the battles from Earthbound. You know, all these strange creatures against psychedelic backgrounds. And this is made all the more via the music. Again, made in that style of the 80s vaporwave slash hippie, you know, ah, meow, welcome to Woodstock, man, peace and love. Like, the, again, the music is made in that 80s Woodstock hippie style with a bit of vaporwave mixed in, and it really, really complements the visuals, with each area and each fight having some amazing tracks, like the airship ride, which is one of my favourites. Alright, let's, uh, let's take off. Can we go into space? Goodbye, my people need me. Bye, world below. Max altitude. Ah. Ah. Fine. Okay. Oh, let's let's go to this island over here. Is there anything else on this side? No. There's an island over there. We'll go to later. Let's go to this island over here. God, the airship music. Genuine banger. survey this land so we have to get through a desert all the way to another big castle or the boss fight against the waxen king link Okay, so I'm gonna like snap this guy to get him open. Yeah, fuck you. And then we're gonna we're gonna start burning this guy as well. And then Soma is gonna begin the charge up. So every time again certainly different from the normal music you would hear on this kind of adventure and it, it's nice it's a nice refreshing break from the norm and it gets you more into this world as it does make this world feel like its own Hylix 2 or the world of Hylix because the world is also from number one but the visuals combined with the music really makes the Hylix world its own and makes it really stand apart from other games of this genre. Now being an indie project there is not much to the story here. The game itself is only 8 to 11 hours long depending on not whether you want to go for 100% or not. But it follows off from Hylix 1, however don't worry if you've never played Hylix 1 as it gives you a nice little recap at the very beginning before you begin. Where in the beginning the evil being Gibby once tried to take the fluid of creation for his own, but he was stopped by the moon-headed man Wayne, that's you, and his friends. But so great was his evil, and so fiercely did he cling to life, that he was impossible to destroy completely, and so 
the one remnant that could not be destroyed. Gibby, his soul, was locked away in an Iron Maiden and buried deep, deep in the bowels of the earth to keep the world safe. But now, Hylix 2 begins, where his soul calls out for another, a mad priest and the cult of Gibby, beckoning them to the desert to dig up the Iron Maiden and free his soul so that he may reconstitute himself and reach Hylum Xylum, the heart of the world, where he will bathe in the fluids of creation, and all shall become as part of Gibby. And now with this imminent danger, it is up to Wayne and his crew to once again set out to stop the evil creature Gibby. So while not the most complicated or complex story, it works and it's great for two reasons. One, the simplicity of the story fits with the, the simple yet striking aesthetic of the world, but moreover we don't need complexity because it's clear who our final boss is and what a bastard he is. Something I, I hate in modern games and TV shows. I, I, I hate this because it's like, I see Gibby and I'm like, yes, finally, a refreshing break. As what a lot of modern games and shows tend to try and do nowadays is make the bad guy one or two things. A, they either try and make the bad guy good with a last minute ass pull redemption like White Diamond. I have destroyed countless galaxies. I have murdered more people than I can count. And when my fellow leaders of Blue and Yellow Diamond try to oppose me, I wiped their minds and took control of them because they are but a means to an end. For me, White Diamond, the final boss, the true asshole. Oh, but a fat kid said, I'm a child, what's your excuse? So 5,000 years of bloodshed and murder is all forgiven in a 30 second interim period. Or Paper Mario, the Origami King with fucking Ollie. I have destroyed the kingdom and I have bent everyone to my will. All of Bowser's minions are now origami as I and do as I bid and all these toads must suffer upon my wrath. But because you have defeated me, Mario, I must, uh, I must protrude to you. I must extend my royal apology. And in my dying breath, even though I'm the bad guy, in my dying breath, I am now good. Let me use my last moment in this world to save the world. Here, Olivia, use my power and I get my last minute redemption. Why? Why couldn't you just be a bastard? Why? Why? So that's one thing. Or they take somebody that was a complete evil bastard in the past and remake them to be good. One in particular that comes to mind, which I, I'm not reviewing by the way, I am, I'm not playing it, I'm not reviewing it, but it's a good fucking example, is the Dark Queen from Battletoads. Taking this, you know, this right here, taking this figure of fear, uh, you know, this Dark Queen, it's in the fucking name, this, this figure of fear across the galaxy. She commands kingdoms across the galaxy with her iron grip. And she also dresses the part. And they turn this into a cowardly little girl that looks like every generic bad guy ever. And also give her 
a not completely commanding and dominant attitude because that's too evil, just a slightly sarcastic, snarky attitude to say, hey, I'm evil, but not really. I mean, you can't even fucking dominate somebody. What the fuck happened to you? Many people, as you can see from this image here, call this the Tumblr effect, where we take a very strong, independent female of villainy, like, you know, the Dark Queen, or Maleficent, you know, remember the mistress of all evil? No, it cannot be! Now shall you deal with me, O oh Prince, and all the powers of hell! <laughs> and we tumblerize them with uh, the clothing that is now no longer revealing because you can't have that on Tumblr and taking the, the Maleficent I'm the mistress of all evil I can turn into a big black dragon and saying go Sora I, Maleficent, the mistress of all evil, that wants you dead, shall protect you from this swarm of nobodies. Go, Sora, defeat Xemnas, while I, the mistress of all evil, that wants you dead, and technically should be able to control these evil creatures, holds them off, because I have had a change of heart. I have felt the goodness in my- me, the mistress of all evil, has felt the goodness in my heart, Sora. So even though I'm supposed to be a bastard, I am now actually a good guy. Now shall you deal with me, O oh Prince, and all the powers of hell! While I keep these creatures at bay, you devise a way to vanquish them forever. Maleficent. Why you tumblerize Maleficent? Why you tumblerize the Dark Queen, you fuck? So it's just nice. I, I like Gibby. I like Gibby because it's just nice to have a total bastard that is a total bastard for the sake of it and will not stop being a total bastard no matter what. And the only way to stop him is to kill him. And even when you kill him, he's that much of a bastard that he's like, No, I'm not going to die. You have got to imprison my soul in an Iron Maiden, or I will come back and continue to be a bastard. Because even death won't stop me from being a bastard. I like that. Please have more of these. Please have more Gibbies and Bill Cyphers and don't Tumblrize things. And don't give people last minute redemptions like fucking White Diamond. Or Ollie, don't do that, please. So yes, I like the story because it's simple and we have a goal and we have a villain that is a villain and likes being a villain and won't get a last minute fucking asshole redemption. Hylix 2 is mostly a RPG with a few overworld and mini world platforming sections. I'll cover the platforming first as it's really easy. Basically across your adventure you will gain team members and each team member will give you an ability like the ability to fly for a short distance and land. So like here I want to go to the glove store that is just to the right. So what we do is we fly across this gap which is basically platforming and we land on this platform here. It's not that heavily platform based, but just like Paper Mario, it's something to break up the fights. You know, or you've done like four or five, maybe even six fights in a row. So, you know, here's a little platforming section. Here's a little bit of a puzzle. You know, just, just a little bit to vary it up, just a little bit to break from the constant RPG fights, which is nice, I like that. So it's nothing big and fancy, but it's just that little extra thing to break up the battles, which is fine. And there is also a, a few points, uh, arcade, basically an 8-bit minigame, but at least it's not absolutely fucking terrible. And it, it's just some full platforming in this little 
arcade space. You're like a little mini Wayne and you can shoot. And again, that's fine. It's full platforming. You can get some extra rewards that I'll get into in a bit. Like the uh, one of them gives you a key to get a paper cup, which just uh, gives you more HP. So yeah, you can get a, a couple of extra rewards. But again, it's fine. It serves its purpose. I had no complaints aside from one jump in the second arcade game. Just one jump seems just a little bit too stretched for me. Like, I had to do that one jump several times. And I'm like, I'm off the platform. I I have to be like one pixel. My entire body is floating in the air. And what, one pixel of my my shoe is touching the, the, the ledge. Then I jump and I can barely make it. So there's only one jump that seems a little bit too stretched, but whatever. Because again, it, it's it's aside from one single jump, it's fine, serves its purpose. And the main meat comes from the RPG style of game. And it is classic RPG. It is as classic RPG as you can get. Four team members, turn based each dropping items, each using magic, each using swords, you know, warriors, mages, alchemists, and all the enemies dropping items after a battle. And these items are very unique in the way that the, the gimmick of the game will progress, which I'll get into. We'll do the easy items first. We have items like bananas and cookies and juice items that recover your HP and MP that have great animations. Bones, which are the game's coins, which are used to buy weapon and armor upgrades. Uh, then you've got the antennae. So remember those TV people I talked about on the TV island? Well, they will make your magic stronger. So every enemy that dies you will get a set amount of antennae. You take them to TV Island and give them to the main TV man and be like, hey, I want to make my magic stronger. It's like, yep, you, you bring me some antennae, so we're going to charge your magic by X amount, so you're, you're becoming stronger. But we'll get into magic later because that factors into uh, the spells, and I want to do the spells separately. And the most interesting thing that you get out of these fights is the meat. <laughs> that was terrible. That was a terrible meat impression. But yeah, the, the thing that's the most interesting is the meat, which is one of the game's most unique selling points and something that I've never seen in an RPG. Meat is the flesh of the enemies and the bosses. Like, it is their literal corpse and when you kill enemies and bosses they will drop meat which even in death will not be lost once they die and you claim that meat that meat is now in your inventory forever so don't worry about dying and upon death you go to a little mini area called the afterlife which will allow you to um, return to any fast travel point you've unlocked via this pool of soul sand here, but in this area is a machine that turns the flesh of fallen enemies into HP for your whole team, which creates two things. One, a good sense of power scaling, as with every enemy you kill, you feel like you're getting stronger. Each flesh that you eat you get more tanky, you can take more hits. Each antennae you give to the TV people, your magic is getting stronger. Every fight feels like actual progression. Every fight is just moving that meter, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second. But two, it creates a risk reward style system. So you don't get party members specific points of the story and you will fight your first enemy alone as Wayne so you now have a choice do you because the meat goes to every single team member so do you want to take 
the flesh of the enemies you've killed as Wayne and just give it to Wayne so that you can pass the next set of enemies alone as Wayne with relative ease or do you want to hold that meat? Do you want to struggle as Wayne? Then you get the second person. Do you want to hold that meat? Do you want to struggle as two people? You get the third person. Do you want to hold that meat? Do you want to struggle as three people? Then you get your fourth person. Then you trade all your meat in at once. So it becomes a, a risk-reward style play system. Do you want to just be rewarded instantly? And have a nice, you know, uh, a nice... Ex uh, what's, what's the reverse of a slope? A hill? Like, an, not an incline. It's not an incline. Because an incline is going down. A ramp. I'm just going to say a ramp. But yeah, do you want a nice a nice little ramp of steady progression where, oh, I've just got Wayne, eat the meat. I've got Wayne, eat the meat. I'm, I'm having a nice steady time. But when you get to the end, because you've been doing it this way, the last guy that you get, well, he's not going to have as much HP because he didn't get as much meat as Wayne. So he is effectively weaker I mean, you can still make him stronger via weapons and items, but he is technically weaker because you've been eating the meat across your journey. So do you want just that nice steady ramp of progression? Or do you want to do a Dark Souls? Do you want to throw your head at a brick wall over and over and over until you've got all four characters, then cash in when you've got all four characters? So all four of them get the benefits, and then the end of the game is just like full, nice, gentle, downhill glide. You're just, you've got on your sled, and you're just sliding on that nice downhill, because everybody got the benefits. So the meat is a really fantastic, like, idea, because it's up to you how you want to play. But as I say, you've got the meat. With each meat you eat, you get more HP, you're becoming more tanky, you can get more hits. Each antenna you give to the TV people, your magic's getting stronger, you're becoming more powerful. Each coin that you get, you can buy, and they don't degrade by the way, there's no degradation, just thought I'd bring that up. But you can buy stronger armor to have more defense, stronger weapons to deal more damage. Each fight feels like real progression. Flip this to the other game we were playing at the time, Paper Mario The Origami King, where fights are literally pointless. Like they are only there to waste everyone's time. First, rather than just a normal RPG system, it's the Bumbo Ring that starts to wear on you after a while. It just does. And secondly, the battle is over. The enemies have been defeated. Oh, great. Well, what do I win? Nothing! Now get out! Uh, what? Get the fuck out! Exactly. Nothing! I mean, you get a few coins, but they are literally only... They only are there for a few collectibles. Which, considering how many coins there are on the overworld, with some enemies like the Monty Moles that you talk to, giving you a bag of 1,000 coins, you never need to do a battle. Hence, I say in the review, the, the Paper Mario review, I say at this point in the Paper Mario review, Drop this whole RPG charade. It's not an RPG anymore. It's shit. The, the more you try and make the new Paper Mario's an RPG, the more shit they actually are. Whereas if you just stick to the good stuff, you know, the collectathon, the giant open worlds, the puzzles like in the Great Sea, the Wind Wake section, and the puzzles in the Egyptian section, it's better. So like, the battles are pointless. Just drop this whole RPG charade and go for the full adventure collectathon. But with its roots set in RPG, like a thousand year door, there were many people, including myself, being like, 
this, you know, the, the heat, the Hylix stuff now, this, this is all I want. Why can't we just have this? Why can't we have this? And it was a great contrast game to play a side origami king. As you know, oh, we're having fun on the Great Sea, we're having fun in Egypt, we're having fun watching Bowser Jr. fucking die and get decapitated. We're, we're having fun, but then, you know, these fun moments in between these, we've got the ring battles and, like, when you... <laughs> When you're doing the longer ring battles, like the fucking Velementals, you know, it got tiring. So, like, it was a great uh, contrast game, because it's like, hey, we're having fun, but, ah, uh, you know, the ring battles, uh, they're getting a bit too boring now. So we swap over, and we had this refreshing, classic RPG battle system, where you actually have to think as while most solutions are fairly easy, bosses still can take a lot of damage and they can still dish out a lot of damage. So even with the ultimate weapons and spells, you still have to designate who is going to be your knight doing the physical damage, who is going to be your black mage casting ultima, who is going to be your white mage casting the healing and giving the healing items out and who is going to be your alchemist your sword and board character that is going to be doing physical damage most of the time but can give out a potion or an item if things are getting a little bit too dicey and it really made the boss fights feel so good as you you can hear me i'm going to play the final fight with Gibby, so slight spoilers, but you're going to hear me play this fight, and you're going to see how engaging it is, as I'm like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, you take this item, you take this item, you charge up this spell, listen, watch. Link. Okay, so I'm gonna like snap this guy to get him open. Yeah, fuck you. And then we're gonna we're gonna start burning this guy as well. And then Soma is gonna begin the charge up. So every time he's gonna rap, is he? Okay, that's fine. Wayne's got the most damage, so Wayne's just gonna knock that guy the fuck down. And we're gonna try and get this guy open for the for the wave that's inbound. And we're also gonna get that guy a little bit weaker, ready for the ready for the wave. Wave artifact, both of them. Wayne's taking some hits. You still gotta snap this guy though. With Wayne, you gotta snap. And with Demetheus, you gotta open him up. However, with program... Uh, let's use the Ting. Eat the banana, Wayne. Get yourself, get yourself, uh, get yourself topped up here. And then with Soma, she ain't got enough for a wave artifact, but she can crisp. She can get a double burn on this guy, though. He's got rid of his burn. Okay. 
Right, Wayne. Snap him. Demetheus. Snap him. Get, get that wrap off. Because I, I get what this fight is. This fight is like fucking Moth Eva and Zap. If you kill one, that that walking guy gets mega angry. And if you kill the other, this mage is just going to bring him back. So we got to kind of get him dead at the same time. So this guy's still currently higher. So we're going to going to give him a little little taste of that. And then we're going to give him a little little taste of this. All right. So now, Error's getting a bit weak, but we're gonna go town on this guy, 53. Uh, just open him up, give him, a, give him a open up, make sure he takes that burn damage. Uh, but Proang, gonna snap the mage, and Soma, gonna snap him. There you go. Oh, you fuck. You fuck. Don't matter, you're dead. You, you lose. I win. Fuck you. We got 20 meat. Wow. Was that not more engaging than this? Yes. Yes, it was. So it was a nice contrast. Like, don't get me wrong. We had fun with the open world aspects of Paper Mario, like the Wind Waker Oceans and the puzzles in the desert. But when you have a 20 minute elemental ring fight, you, you, you get bored, you get mad, and you just wish that you could have the good old RPG system back. And Hylix 2 just walks in and is like, I got that good old RPG system, you come play with me for a while. You just leave Paper Mario, you leave that, that fucking elemental over there, you come play with me for a while. So, Hylix 2, in terms of the main gameplay, is just, as the Jackal would say, uh, as, uh, as our favourite Jackal would say, it just works. Now, as you saw from that fight with Gibby, there is also some really unique magic spells. As in this game, spells are called gestures. So, like, performing a wave, you wave with your hand, and as you wave with your hand, it does a wave-like attack, which is a really clever way of um, doing the magic. Because, you know, like most of the time in RPGs, you say fireball, you know, you hold your hand in front of you, you point at your target, you say fireball, the fireball comes out. So you're still using your hand to cast a spell, but they've integrated, rather than just point your hand at a thing and shoot, they've like, well, what if you actually have to do, you know, Naruto... Shadow clone jutsu and do all the magic moves with your hands to make the spell come out. So I Really like that aspect, but each of these Magic spells has a charged form with the wave as you can see here It's sending out two extra spike blasts at the end So you get your initial wave and then you get these two spike blasts. So it adds it now adds on, it adds an extra layer of strategy to what originally was just a magic spell. Are you going to do the constant quick magic, like boom, 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 boom? Or, do you want to have your mage take a turn to charge up, and you cast, you take a second um, mage, and cast protect on them so they're safe? Do you want to take a turn to charge up? So that you can release that big damage on the second turn. And then, there is also items like um, the weapons and armor that also pair really nicely with magic spells. So it's a good idea. And it also, again, adds a third layer of strategy. So, um, for example, just take what I did with the main warrior. My main warrior has got all of the the super armor on. He's got mega health, mega defense, a lot of HP. And as you can see in this fight with Gibby, I give Wayne the cursed gloves. This makes him take constant. This the, These can't be removed. 
these attributes cannot be removed. This makes him take constant fire damage and he is also weak, meaning he takes times 2 damage from everything. These statuses cannot be removed and there is no benefit to Wayne for wearing these. You don't get extra attack power, you don't get extra magic power, it is literally there just to be a bad item. Now you will say to me, these gloves are really bad as it's all negatives with no benefits, but if he learns the spell Link Mollusk then you can really get this train rolling as Link Mollusk passes all negative status effects to all, yes all, including bosses, passes all these negative status effects to all enemies on the field, including bosses. Combine this with the ultimate spell and you can really devastate. Turn 1, Wayne Cast Link Mollusk. All enemies and bosses are weak and will take double damage and are f on fire. Turn 1 as well, Fish Girl charges the ultimate spell, she activates charge. Turn 1, your third character casts Protect so that she doesn't die. Turn 2, ultimate spell. All enemies, including the boss, take times 2 ultimate damage and whatever burn damage was going to be inflicted on them as well. And there is a way to make this go even further beyond! Remember the antennae that the enemies have been dropping. As mentioned, they can be taken to the TV people on TV Island, which charges up one spell, your charge spell, adding plus attack for every antennae collected. So if you found all of them, all 100, it's charge spell damage, which would be the ultimate, plus 100. So, you could have a setup of the, the gloves, the cursed gloves. Right, cursed gloves, they are now weak and on fire. Charge the ultimate spell, meaning all enemies and bosses will take times 2 damage plus, or sorry, times 2 ultimate damage plus 100 damage from the charge of the charge spell plus the burn as well. So you can just make these magical strategies. There's strategies for bad items. It's like in Bug Fables, where they give you Poison Badge. Dude, why would I use that Poison Badge? It literally poisons me, and it that's all it does. It has no other effect. Why would I put the Poison Badge on V? Because think about the other spells you've got. Think about the other items you've got. Think more about the strategies and you can absolutely fuck over everybody with a poison build. So that's that's what I'm doing here. I basically got a poison build. Boom. I am I am inflicting my negatives onto everybody and then my partner is casting a double ultimate with also plus 100 charge. So it's good. It's good. <clears throat> so uh yeah. That's uh it really incentivizes you. And and again, just like I forgot to mention this, because the antennae and the meat, you know, the, the flesh that gives you more HP and the antennae that charge the spells drop from the enemies, it really incentivizes you to do every battle, to get every kill, thus getting every single piece of meat you can to make yourself as tanky as possible, to get all the antennae you can to give to log here to make your spell your charge spell as strong as possible bet you thought considering i kept saying tv man i was not going to make a reference to log there and uh well you were you were wrong but yeah th this is it. It, it it's just got so many strategies 
like an actual classic RPG, and going from this to the ring battles felt like a detriment or reverse, because we usually start with Paper Mario. Going from the ring battles to the classic RPG system, it's like, I feel so much better. Why can't we have this? Why can't we have this? Oh, and before you ask, before anyone asks, no, you can't go infinite, as once a battle is done, the enemies are dead. <laughs> you know, uh, let me take a drink to do the voice. My, my dear sweet Kevin, you have consumed their flesh and made it a part of you, so they cannot come back to this mortal coil, Kevin. <laughs> That was a bad meat canyon. But yes, you have consumed their flesh. They can no longer return to this mortal coil. So every battle you do, it once it's won, it's won forever. And as for the exploration part, as like any RPG, you go out your way to earn the extra things like the ultimate spell. And it's great. Most of the clues and puzzles do take a second to work out. But when you work them out, you feel good about yourself, especially the cryptic ones. The one and only thing I kind of hate, and there might be something in the game, but as far as I know, and as far as like all of the chat knew, we never found it on stream. Which is the three sages, you need to find three sages to learn the ultimate spell. Like, the one in the garden maze was easy. It was cryptic enough. Like, it, it was pretty cryptic, but we still found the clue at least. Uh, we found where it was, uh, and, you know, the, this, this glowing maze, it visually communicates what you have to do. So, we figured it out, feel really good about ourselves. But the other two, the other two are just some crazy, maddening, obscure bullshit, and I have no se no shame in saying I looked it up. Like one, okay, you have to jump into the, into the abyss. Now let me set the stage for you here. As you can see from this clip, you have to jump at this one invisible wall, and you fall through into the abyss. Now, this is at the end of the game. You know, this is the ultimate spell. This is the final spell. This is the end of the game. Nowhere, nowhere up until this point can you go through an invisible wall. If you're in a cave like this, all these walls, you can't walk through them. There's no way through them. They are full invisible walls. So, by this stage in the game, you have pretty much been trained to not worry about invisible walls. Because this is end game. And nowhere up until this point had there been, at least as far as we know, any clue to say go through this one invisible wall. Like maybe, maybe there is a clue that's like the dark side of light in the fridge room. As there is a fridge in this room. But as far as myself and the chat know. No. There is there is no clue. So without looking up two of those sages. How you're supposed to find them on your own. Is beyond me. But still. Again. It rewards you for doing the fights. And doing exploration. Which for an RPG is great. So, my final verdict for Hylix 2 is a fantastic 4 out of 5, with my one and only gripe being the final mages, as they seem way too fucking cryptic. Like, there is no fucking way anybody can figure this shit out, and like, Again, if there is a clue, I didn't find it. And if there is, 
my bad. But like, when we were just looking and not looking it up, like just slamming into every random wall, we, we were on this ship for three hours. Me and the chat, me and the Twitch chat on this for three hours. We could not figure it out. I told people not to look it up. We were on this ship for three hours. It was just like so cryptic and bullshit. So like, that's my one point off because by the end of it, it got really frustrating. But the rest of it though, the rest of it is a very well-made, short and sweet RPG experience. At 11 hours max, if you are going for 100%, it's around just as long as it has to be. It never outstays its welcome and it ends in an excellent way. When it ends basically when it feels like it needs to end. You know, it doesn't drag it out. It ends exactly when it feels like it needs to end. With its very unique art style and chill as fuck soundtrack, it will keep you hooked for all 11 hours as you want to keep going just to see what weird shit you will see next and what smooth jays you will hear next. Aw oh, shit. It's so smooth. Like, oh, it's so oh, man, smooth. I'm just flying out of this chair. Oh, and if yeah. you are currently playing something like Origami King, it can be the perfect complement and contrast. If the Bumbo Ring becomes too tiresome and you just want a normal RPG, then load this up. So, great work and a great game. And of course, a big thank you and shout out to the Patreons, which were right this... For this month, it's been, it's been a long one and I'm diving right into a second one, because uh, I have already started work on the Mario 3D All-Stars pack. And Spyro, the game's not even out yet. Well, I mean, kind of technically, but you don't need to hear me review, like, oh my god, these graphics on a 20-year-old game are so amazing, dude. So you don't need to hear about, like, the graphics and the music. So that bit I can do, because that's a 20-year-old game and we can already do that. So that's the next thing coming up. And I've already started work on that one. So that one should be ready by release date. So, uh, yeah, but... For now, thank you, thank you for this month's Patreon of Daddy. I really do appreciate it. Really does help out. And if you would also like to support the channel even further, there is a link to the Patreon in the description below, as well as links to the Discord if you want to come in and chat, and Twitter to see when I'm tweeting stuff and the uh, stream, so you can come and watch the entire stream of the game live. We will be streaming. Uh, the 3D All-Stars Mario 64 in like six days when it goes live, but I'm going to try and work on the review before then, so uh, yes, thank you Deddy, and thank you everybody else for watching, and leaving a like, and subscribing, and all that jazz, and I will see all of you in the next review.